everyone for uh, coming for the last day of the boot camp. Uh, we'll start with Alexander Mandri, uh, who will give his second lecture about uh, mass flow, electrical flows, and uh, connection with the uh, Okay, thanks, Yanis. Okay, so welcome back. And so, as you remember, last time I gave it sort of an overview of, sort of, of like how this three concepts, analytical flows, optimization, max flow connect. Well, I didn't really talk about optimization much. This will change in this lecture. And but you know, at least gave the drawn the, the general picture. And yeah, what we will do today, we'll try to finally see some actual action there and uh, just think about uh, how can we use analytical flows to approximate uh, uh, max flow in undated graphs. Okay. So just as a, a quick, just as a quick uh, uh, reminder, so what was, the problem that we are trying to solve is the maximum flow problem, in which we essentially are looking for the feasible ST flow of maximum value. So a feasible ST flow is the one that satisfies flow conservation constraints, so no leaks at vertices other than S and T, uh, and doesn't doesn't overflow any arc. So the flow on the arc is at most its capacity, and what we want to maximize is this value, which is just the amount of stuff that we send from S to T. Okay, so this is the problem. And just before I continue, so I just want to make one important point. So last time I gave you the, you know, the sort of the, the history of a max flow problem. But while doing this, uh, because of editing, well, bad editing slides, I forgot about one important result. So as I, well, when I was talking about this, I said that essentially this is the state of the art for the max flow problem. But as of last year, this is not really true anymore. So there is a beautiful result of Lee and Sitford, who actually are able to like get rid of this trade-off and sort of and, and get the right behavior on the sparsity. So essentially now the running time is the best running time for max flow is m square root of n as opposed to mean of these two things. Okay, so this is always better than this. This of course doesn't change the sparse graph picture, but definitely you know changes the picture of the max flow uh, uh, in general. So. Essentially, it's still, we have the barrier of n to the 3 halves here, but now at least we have sort of a right dependence on the sparsity. Like this is the dependence on the sparsity that we expected all along, and for 40 years we couldn't get it. Now these guys finally did it, okay? And interestingly enough, you know, some of these tools, uh, okay, I will, I will talk a little bit uh, about this in the third lectures uh, as well, okay? So this is just, this was just something that I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention last time. And now, as I, as I, as I explained, uh, well, uh, as I just said, and I also explained in the last lecture, sort of what we will focus on uh, today is just trying to like, forget for a moment about the directed max flow and exact solutions. We just want to get an one minus epsilon approximate solution to max flow in undirected graphs, but we want to, uh, again, just beat the SN to the 3 halves bound using electrical flows. Okay? And that's what today's lecture will be about. And essentially, some of the <coughs> concepts and ideas that will show up here will then be a bit refined and somehow combined with some bigger hammers to actually get the, uh, well, the, the exact maximum result for the graphs. And sort of the interesting thing is that, you know, after you see this, and once I will be talking about this in the third lecture today, uh, then uh, essentially you realize that some of the philosophy that, is, that came up in this, in the point of this problem is essentially implemented again in this, uh, in this, uh, in this exact and direct setting, okay? So that's, that's why we are talking about this problem here, okay? So this is the plan. And uh, by the way, are there any questions about <coughs> anything I said last time? OK, any questions about it? Just uh, feel free to interrupt, OK? So of course, as I said, we will use electrical flows. And this, again, is just a quick reminder what electrical flows uh, flow are, at least uh, what is the most convenient definition from our point of view. And from our point of view, electrical flows are just correspond to minimizing, uh, well, the L2 minimization over the space of flow. And as already we very well know, we can compute electrical flows extremely fast, namely in nonlinear time. Okay? So this is just another thing that we will need. Okay? And uh, so let's just, just talk about the algorithm. So last time I gave you the blurb of, you know, sort of what is the general outline of the algorithm. So roughly it's a very simple iterative procedure when we start with treating, well, we, we always treat our edges as resistors with some corresponding resistances. And initially this resistance will be one. And then, you know, what we will do, we'll just repeat the following loop. So we just compute the logical flow which was, uh, of, the, of the prescribed value F star. So F star is the value of max flow that we assume that we know. So we compute this electrical flow with respect to the current resistances. We look at this flow and, you know, we know that the flow conservation constraints will be always preserved, but the problem will be that some of the, uh, uh, some of the edges might be flowing too much. And what we will do, we'll increase resistances on these overflowing edges in some way, and then we'll repeat, and we hope that we will converge in some way after not too many iterations, okay? 
So this is the general outline, and it can be more. Uh, it, it can be made work, and sort of you know. But again, this is just an outline, and actually we have to be very careful about how we instantiate different details of this algorithm. And that's what we will do today. Okay. Okay. So you know how to go about filling in these blanks. Well, it, uh, just a reminder. I already said it that you know we are dealing with, with undirected graphs. So let's forget about directed graphs that they exist for the sake of this uh, of this talk. And also, we assume that all the capacities are one, that the graph is sparse, and again, that the value of the max flow uh, is known to us. Okay? So how, how to go about uh, filling in these blanks? And somehow, the point of start here is just the following uh, interesting observation. Okay? So if I fix some resistances R in my graph, okay, and I compute this uh, electrical flow of value F star in this graph, well, then clearly, I don't expect this electrical flow to obey all the capacity constraints. Okay, I don't. Uh, I really expect that at least for at least one edge, it will be true that the flow on this edge will be much bigger than one, which is the uh, which is the capacity. Okay, so that's definitely that's definitely something I can expect. However, even though the electrical flow will violate some capacity constraints, it still presents the capacity constraints in some much weaker sense, but still in some uh, important sense. Namely, what you can prove is the case is that no matter what the resistances are, then if I look at uh, well, if I look at this, uh, if I look at the expression, which essentially you can, once you divide it by the sum of uh, of the resistances of both sides, so what you will you, what you will get on the left is just the expected overflow when the expectation or the average overflow when the average is taken with respect to resistances, then this average overflow will be at most one. So it will be at most you know what we expect it to be. Okay. So again, this the fact that the average overflow is good doesn't mean that all the edges are, like that no edges overflow and indeed what will happen is very often that there will be edges that overflow a lot but the average will always be good, okay no matter what the resistances are so you're thinking of the resistances as a probability distribution the, uh, let's think about this as a weight okay? okay so essentially this is just a weighting i just want to compute some weighted average of the of the of the overflows and you know, as long as we compute the electrical flow corresponding to the resistances to these weights, it always will be the case that this average, that this average, uh, that this average overflow will be good. Okay, even though some individual arcs, uh, individual edges might flow a lot. Okay. Okay. So this is this is the property that you can show, and in a sense, you know, by just uh, by just the observation, we can view electrical flows as a fast way of solving the following very you know, weak version of Maxwell question, which we call like feasibility on average, when essentially we are given some weights uh, W, and our goal is just to find the flow of value of star that has not, not that has you know, all the overflows at more, uh, all, the flow, all the flows on edge at most one, but just, just, just have the, uh, this, uh, this average weighted flow to be at most one. Okay, so just, this is our task. We don't care about individual edges. We just want to make sure that the average is always good. Okay, so for that, electrical flow are just perfect. They just solve, uh, they just solve the problem in one shot. You just, you know, you just just take uh, weights to be equal to resistances, and you compute electrical flow, and you get. Some. Okay, so you know, of course, this is a very, this is a very weak, uh, this is a very weak uh, uh, version of the, uh, of the, uh, well, this is a very weak version of the Maxwell problem. But the surprising thing is that even though this is a very weak way of solving, like this is a very weak sense in which we can solve Maxwell problem, this ability to solve this problem is already useful to us and actually already allows us to get the algorithm that we actually want, uh, actually, actually want. Okay? So essentially the technique that allows us to take this crude algorithm and turn it into the algorithm that we actually, know, actually, actually want is called multiplicative weight update method and sort of it, it's one of the things that I guess was discovered and rediscovered a couple of times throughout the history. So it's like I think, as, as, as Dick Lipton is saying, you know, the discoverer is not the one who first discovers it, but then the one who does it last time. And I think the last time is, is, is it stems from the work of, of Freud and Shapir, uh, and Shapir on, uh, on boosting. And then Plotkin, Schwein, Stardos, like they, they sort of move this, uh, this paradigm more to, to the optimization uh, setting. And then there's a very nice survey by Aurora, Hazan, and Kale where they sort of very nicely put it together and now it's a very clean frame of the By the way, that's a very distorted uh, version of history. Oh really? So what is actually, I'm, I'm uh, curious to... The, the optimization it came, I think, uh, about a decade before the learning theory stuff and the economists discovered it in the 50s. 
Yes, so, so, so this, this I know that yeah. actually I think there were at least three independent. But the, the, the optimization line that you, uh, you know, the plot Kinshmoist Tardosh is sort of the last of uh, sequence yeah, that started the with Sharoki and Matula in, in the mid 80s. Okay. There are even movies in Nissan. Sorry? Or even movies in Nissan, right? Was yeah, that, Nissan? that's right. Yeah. That, that was okay. later. So, so, yeah. so, so, so this had the mistake of the of the yeah. author, me who don't uh, remember. So in general, like this definitely, like there is a couple of instances yeah. where this idea was discovered because it's one of these beautifully simple ideas. Yeah, and then there was uh, the distributed computing uh, community also discovered it independently. So, and you only break black in the last. Yeah, exactly. I said that there was a, a uh, there, there were previous instances when this was discovered. I didn't even try. To list them no, it's, it's unrelated to the Freud Shapira. They were also the last. Yeah, <laughs> they were also the last in one on yeah. one of the lines, right? And then, like I, I know that at least for like some of the economic stuff, I think it was forgotten. Like, even in the community, I think that yeah. they discovered it and it was forgotten even in the community. That then they so they yeah. realized only on after the fact when they saw it again in the setting of experts that oh, we knew that before, right? Yeah. That's, uh, uh, well, that's one of the things. So. Okay, so I guess uh, maybe I shouldn't put any citations here. That would, that, would solve the, that would solve the problem, I guess. Because indeed, it is a, like this is a problem with a very, you know, very beautiful and simple ideas. They get rediscovered many times, and people don't bother to, you know, sort of say, oh, this is the contribution. They just sit somewhere hidden there as just a tree. But it's a very beautiful and very useful. Okay. So essentially, the way you can think about this technique is just a technique for turning weak algorithms into stronger ones, okay? So in our setting, the way it works is that we take this crude algorithm that is computing this, uh, like that is solving this feasible average max flow problem as a black box, and then what we get out of it is a one SSL approximation uh, algorithm for the max flow problem. So it's, we are sort of, we turn the feasibility on average into, feasibly, uh, into approximate feasibility everywhere, okay? And this is sort of a very generic way. And well, the question is, how can you do this magic? And again, it sounds mysterious now, but once you see the tricks, you will see how ingenious it is and how, you know, how natural it is in the end. So what do we do? Well, the underlying the idea is that the way we construct our, uh, our feasible everywhere, well, almost feasible everywhere max flow is by repeatedly querying this uh, crude algorithm with different ways. Okay? So essentially, here is our black box that implements that solves this crude uh, algorithm. And we will maintain some weights, which initially will all be equal to one. Okay? And then what we will do, well, we'll just play the following game. So we'll just we'll take our weight, we'll send it to the uh, this crude algorithm oracle, and it will give us some flow back. Okay? So what we know about this flow, we know that of course this is a flow of value of star, and also that it's feasible on average with respect to the weights that we provide. Okay? So we will get some flow, and then based on this flow, we will update our weights somehow. Okay? And then we have new weights. So we will send these weights again to the crude algorithm. This will again give us some feedback. <coughs> and you know, we will look at this new flow, <coughs> and update our, our, our weights based on that, and we will just keep doing this for some number of iterations. Yeah. And now, the way we will get our, our, no, uh, our flow that is actually feasible uh, like everywhere, it's almost feasible everywhere, it just we will take an average of all the flows that we have seen, that, that, that we ever were returned from this crude algorithm. Okay, so we'll not look at any particular flow and return it. We actually will take the average of everything that we see. Okay. So that's the so that's the, the way that this is general outline. And of course the crucial step here is you know, how do we update weights to make it work? Okay. So imagine that we are somewhere in this procedure, so we have <coughs> our we have our current uh, weights wi minus one, we sub we supply it to our good algorithm, we get some flow back, and now how do we get you know, the next creation of weights? Well, what we just do, we just look at each, each of the weights, which corresponds to the edges of the graph. And what we do, well, we do the multiplicative update, and hence the name of the method. So essentially, we multiply each weight by 1 plus epsilon times the flow on this edge in this flow fi return, and normalize by rho i, when rho i is just the maximum congestion in, incurred by fi. So essentially, this is just the maximum flow uh, on edge that this flow fi has. Okay? The reason why we, want that, that why we are introducing this normalization is just we want to make sure that this multiplicative update is a number between 1 and, and, and 1 plus epsilon. Okay? So we don't want this uh, evolution of weights to be too drastic. We also want to be simple enough. And that's the way why we normalize it. Okay? So essentially, clearly, uh, none of these flows here can be bigger than, uh, than, the row, uh, than the row i. So clearly, this will be always something at most 1. So this will be at most epsilon. So the whole thing will be never bigger than 1 plus epsilon. 
Okay. So this is the way the weights are uh, the weights are evolving, and now the underlying dynamics that makes it all work is just the following. So if you have an edge that suffers a large overflow in some iteration, then clearly uh, what its weight will be multiplied by one plus epsilon. Okay, so we, let's say the, the the overflow is getting close to maximum. So so its weight is multiplied by one plus epsilon. So essentially, if some uh, if some edge uh, suffers you know large overflow uh, too often, then its its weight will just skyrocket after some time because you will get exponential growth in it. But on the other hand, we know that each of these flows is feasible on average. Okay, and using that, you know, so we know that the average overflow is small. So, so the average increase of weight is pretty is pretty modest. So, in particular, when we look at how the sum of all the weights grows, it grows not too fast. Okay, and now once we have this two observation, so what we know is that you know if there was some edge that suffers large overflow too often, then well its weight was skyrocket, but we know it can't skyrocket because we know that the whole sum of the weights doesn't increase too much. So, so, like, so we can just uh, get some inequalities out of this, and what we the conclusion that we get out of that is that essentially no edge, there is no edge in our graph that suffers large overflow too often. Okay, every edge can suffer large overflow from time to time, but there is no edge that consistently is getting large overflow. Okay, and once now we take an average of all the flows in the end, then essentially for every individual edge, this occasional large overflow they will just be averaged out there, so that the average overflow actually will not be that terrible. And essentially, that's roughly the whole idea. Like this is the whole idea behind this method. Now you have to do some math to prove it. And you know, when you do this, then you know, then what you will get. And again, this is just the survey that provided it. This is not. They are not the first one to come up with this math. But this is one place to just look it up. Then essentially, you will you will notice that once you take roughly rho over epsilon squared iterations of this method, then this average will always pro will correspond to uh, to to well, one minus epsilon approximate. Maximum flow. Rate. Essentially, what will happen is that the overflow of each edge will be at most one plus epsilon than what it should be. Then you can just divide by one plus, epsilon, one plus epsilon, so you will get a feasible flow that achieves one minus epsilon roughly of the of the of the of the flow value. Okay. So, do, do you mean actually the flow or some scaled version of it? Yes. Yeah, so you have to divide by one plus epsilon. So we take the average and then divide by one plus epsilon. Then it's going to be feasible. Where, where does the capacity of one go into? It's, it's hidden. Like well, here everything I said is for uh, like for unit capacities. When you have when you have non-unit capacities, then essentially you normalize these things by capacities. Okay, so you look at the relative congestion. Okay, and just like uh, and okay, this this row here is just the maximum of overflows that we ever observed. Okay, so this is the the third that we get. And also just a couple of remarks. So essentially, the way to think about this row is roughly it's roughly a measure, you know. How much the answers of our crude algorithm, in, in this case, you know, it is the electrical, like in our case, it's the electrical, electrical flow computation, how much different it is from the actual max flow. It's like, this is a measure of similarity. It's like when rho is close to 1, then our, uh, the, the answers returned by our oracle are actually essentially max flows. So we expect a faster convergence. If they are very different, then we expect a slower convergence. In, in particular, it's not hard to see that this linear dependence on the row is unavoidable. Okay, because what happens is that if there is even one edge that suffers an overflow or flow, then just to average it out, yes, like we have to divide by a number big enough, like comparable to rho, to just you know, get it some, to be something close to one. Okay. And in particular, you can actually prove that this whole bound is, is only one. Is there a way to think about this, uh, all these things in terms of some partial differential equations? Or? Yes, and like in a sense, uh, what you are doing, like that's what I said about that you want this average to be smooth enough. Like what you really are doing is you are trying to like discretize like some, uh, uh, like I think that there is a, a partial differential equation that you can write that this is trying to approximate by this average. Okay, so that's exactly sort of that's the reason why. Any of the classical mathematical physics equations that we are actually solving here. Probably yes. Like I would need to think about it, but I'm sure. Okay, I'm sure the answer is yes. I just don't know what the equation is because exactly like that's why we need this like smoothness parameter. Like just we want this approximation to be like essentially what we want the weight to be. We want it to be roughly e to the sum of all the overflows that we have seen so far. And essentially, I think once you take the epsilon to be the limit in zero, then you will get some uh, some uh, some equation, but the differential equation that actually corresponds. I think the answer is yes. I, mean, I think, and I forgot the name of it. There's something in uh, that they call this method. Them doing it. So, so the other thing that reminds me is after John's talk, 
It sure looks like these are Lagrange multipliers or something, and you're doing some yes. kind of different yes. method, and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you and, that, and in the end, since you're adding them all together, you're doing something like a Chevy Chep polynomial of the, of the things or something. Is there some way to rewrite this whole do, thing? I don't think you do Chevy Chep polynomials, but. Well, no, uh, but maybe you get a better answer if you did, right? Then you get to take the, you know, some. That's a good question. Like, in particular, the question, yeah, like, can you get a better, like, so, so this convergence is not ideal. Like, if you could get one over epsilon convergence. Uh, you know, okay. So first of all, like, just as far as I remember, that just for this frame of the way I stated it, when when this thing is a black box and like many things are just black box, I think epsilon squared is the best you can get. But there are also some way to think of the weights as some kind of Lagrange multiplier. Yes. So essentially, like Plotkin's point started, essentially the way they phrase it is, 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 is just a Lagrange relaxation question. Okay. So yes, these weights are the you know are the Lagrange multipliers. Yes, because th that's what you really, 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 that's you really want to get. And it becomes uh, nice to think of it that way or not. Or? I don't think so. I, I, okay. I like maybe I'm biased. <laughs> I, I, I like I like this this point of view. Like in again again like Plotkin's point starters like they they take the Lagrangian uh, the, the Lagrangian perspective. I think it's slightly less cleaner clean when you when you do this, but maybe it's a matter of taste. Okay, so it's we just we're trying to minimize here some probabilities from on the uh, fn subspace a x equals b right. A x equals b expresses the fact that you. Have a uh, exactly you optimizing the, the flow. Yes, and the uh, sum of R E F E squared is the quadratic form that you're trying to minimize. Yes, but uh, well, not really. You are not like okay. So I think well, you are. I mean, magic energy happens inside the oracle. So by the way, this framework works even though there's nothing about electrical flows in here. It's like it just. For any oracle that just gives you this uh, like average uh, like uh, a solution that is good on average, this will work. Okay, so there is nothing like electrical flow. Everything about electrical flow is happening here, okay. And also the initial energy is happening here. Okay, so essentially uh, you like solving this minimization energy of the problem, which is solving max flow. Okay, so this is the whole Johnston, and that's what all is sitting in here. These updates do not really correspond to that. It's like now you just you forget about where is this. Okay, we'll actually recall it again later. But for now, we are forgetting where these uh, flows are coming from. All we know about them is that they are just good. They are just feasible on average. And it, there is no quadratic form that I can see or that that you are really minimizing, right? I just want to add that the original boosting is gradient descent in function space. Yes, and you because can view it also as a gradient descent. Some exponential of of rho. Yes. So essentially, you can or like the, what, of, of your average. Yeah. Some of yeah, so, well, you can also view uh, this, you can get this thing also via, uh, like, uh, well, taking essentially gradient descent after you regularize things with not even choppy, like, there are many points of view, like, okay. Yeah, no, but basically that, uh, the question is, could you do better? Probably, yes. Could you do better? Than steepest descent. I think if you don't have any structure, like, any handle of the structure of the problem, I don't think you can do better. Like I think you would need like the yes, point is that true. if you are just dealing with uh, like such so a the, the general setting this works for is when you know when the your feasible space is just a convex uh, convex convex set and you have access only to this you know linear this is like a black box approach. Yeah, yeah this is within the black box approach. You're thinking that this is yeah. well. I, I don't think it's actually probably the best thing for the black box approach. But then of course the convex bodies that give you this are are very uh, very not nice. Yes, like there are no, nothing close. Flows. Actually, we will take advantage, like to get better bounds, we'll take advantage of the fact that this oracle is not an arbitrary oracle, it's actually a flow oracle, and then we'll use sort of information about our problem. We'll see it uh, today. But for now, you know, if I just think about this bound, an arbitrary complex body, an arbitrary oracle that gives you this feasible and average uh, solutions, this is the best. Way. It's not grading descent also because you average all of the solutions. No, no, this. I mean, yeah, but so no, no. Like you have seen in like Lorenzo's presentation, yes. Like he also was, also was taking averages there. Yes. Like so. So this is actually this is this is not true. So this is mirror descent. That's what I meant. Mirror descent is just a, like a more general version of mirror descent. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Like it's the nice thing about optimization is that you can cast all of these things. Like the real, the ability to like do, to use the optimization <coughs> actually allows you to like to to view uh, like view and like everything is gradient descent in here. It's just the question is what is the space and what's your regularization and what is your normal. But in order to get second order methods, you needed to do something more than just keep around your last thing. You did Chevy Chef or some other kind yes, of yes, yes. method kind of gradient, right? Yes, but this is not doing any Chevy Chef stuff. Yes, so this is but you are averaging them, so you're doing something like yes, taking yeah, all the priors. Like there are, like for instance, one question is on the following. Optimal. Here we are proving a statement about convergence of the average. Which usually, if you think like, what would be nice is to come up with some evolution that just itself converges 
to the right solution. It's, because the thing is that usually, like, you know, if you if you want to prove some convergence of some of some of some sequence, you know, yes, one way of doing this instead of reasoning about the sequence is reasoning about convergence of the of the averages. But usually, the convergence of the average is slower than the convergence, like the direct convergence. Like, if you were able to get a process here that makes this flow that you get converge to the right solution, then actually you would, you know, this would be a huge breakthrough because then you could you know, you could play tricks like taking epsilon to be one half. You know, getting some solution, then you know, halving the epsilon and doing more. And actually, I think you, like, this would be a very powerful tool, but no, 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 no such things is known. And I think that exactly for this to work, you would need to have some additional information about you know, what is hidden in this, in this, in this algorithm. Okay. But I mean, the whole approach here is is effectively working with residuals, right? So, so you're not. It, it's only the average that makes sense. Right, if that loss function were a quadratic, for instance, then yeah. it's exactly the residuals that you would Yeah, yeah, no, like, okay, I'm saying you would need to, like, to have more structure to do anything more. Like, so this, is, this is the best thing. Like, if you were able to get some sequence that converges, it would be great. Like, it doesn't seem uh -huh. that you can. And again, in this, in this general framework of, you know, of that, you know, you just get this oracle that is coming from somewhere that you have no idea where, and you don't know this convex kind of problem you are solving, this is the best you can do. Okay, so no of this to do that. Okay, so this is uh, so this is the method, and now, uh, well, what is the bottom line for us is that essentially our algebraic flow primitive gives us such an implementation of a of a crude oracle for a Maxwell problem, and you know, and we can just use the multiplicative for weights update framework to help us fill in our problems. Okay, so uh, can you go back? To, sorry, uh, to, yes. There's something a little bit weird here, and that is that you increase the weights even for edges that are very far from being yes. saturated. Yes. Yes. Well, this is, I guess, this is just cleaner this way to analyze. I think nothing would really. Wait, let me think. Yes, nothing would really bad happen. No, 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 no. Actually, no. This is. This, wait, let me think. About it. No, nothing would happen if you just like this update would be just you know like this cutting off any updates for things that are not close to. Uh, that are not close to being, uh, you know, being uh, saturated. Because you really, what you really want to combat is the satur saturation. It's because you take average in, in the end. So if they look at the iterations in which it was far from being close to capacity, essentially you can just have an analysis when you, for this you are accounted one way, and then for the others you make the argument. And what if you would actually, instead of taking the absolute value of the flow, take the, the difference between the flow and one? So, so, so you might get a negative. You might you might reduce the yeah so actually at least like so so by, by the way yeah so here we are using the fact that sort of we can only we are only, we only have losses we don't have yeah. gains you can also extend this framework to the case when when you have both losses and gains but then actually your convergence analysis goes worse it oh, starts depending, okay. start depending quadratically on the on the width okay. and uh, again I think this also is probably so like, I think you look at the random like okay this all goes back to this expert framework. And for which you know this the guarantees that like the guarantees that you get here essentially like so that that's what Aurora has and Kale are doing they essentially cast it as an instance of the, uh, mm -hmm. the the express problem and then for express problems we know tight bound and essentially they transfer over here okay so the, the black box is solving a minimization with, you know there's an arbitrary constant you get the same solution uh, sorry again so the, the the A there is solving a minimization problem where if well, you increase the effective resistances by a constant factor, then right, it's the same problem. Yeah, yeah. So like, uh, well, if you if you scale everything by my like, constant, it doesn't matter. It's like you yeah. just care about the solution, not about the value of the solution. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, no, but like I think like you want it does affect the right. So, so like the point is that actually, okay. So what's happening here? Like you could do it with one, like uh, like this minus one and absolute value of that. Actually, you would see the same convergence because you can refine the analysis of this gain and losses thing. And actually, what really matters is it's really you know how much, like you multiply you know how much is the width in one direction and the width yeah, in the other direction. Yeah, the width in the other direction is small. It's small, so it will still work. But like again, like this wouldn't give anything better, and this will complicate the picture. It's like this is uh, well, actually okay, later on we will. It's really important to us that actually this updates look the way they do. Okay. And, uh, and actually this is this matters and it's just that intuitively it seems like a more correct way of doing it. Sort of, but 
you know, it's in any case you can think that like what is a max flow? Max flow is just an infinite minimization question. Right? So you just want to minimize like you want to pack this like send this extra unit of flow respect to like making the largest capacity to be as small as possible. So in general, any flow is bad for you. Of course, you know that you will have to have some flow, but you know, any flow is bad for you. So you just are penalizing for flowing anything. Uh -huh. right? It's just it's unfair, but still the guys who don't flow too much are penalized much less than the guys who actually flow too much. Right? That's okay. So you're actually computing something stronger. You're computing them. A, a, ma a min energy max flow? No, uh, you're not like each like each individual answers is the uh, like okay. I see what you're saying. I'm not sure even how to make it precise. Because it? it's probably if, if it may actually be unique or maybe some formula as opposed to. No, we, are, we are taking averages which don't work well with quadratic minimization, right? So uh, I don't think that you can like intuitively yes, like sort of your max flow will be will tend to be a bit more like. Cheaper energy-wise than you know maybe the worst max flow that you can find, but I don't think that you can make it in any way precise, right? And and averages usually do that just they don't work well with uh, with quadratic okay. right? So so I don't think that there is anything that you can really like uh, anything that you can really state. Okay, good. So uh, I like questions, so thanks for asking them. Uh, okay, so this was our algorithm, which roughly boils down to these two things. You know, we start with something for this is a big one. When you compute the digital flow, increase the resistances that are on our flowing edges, and repeat. Okay, so now this was the this was the skeleton, and now we know how to fill the rest. So you know, one thing is that now we want our like our resistances evolve exactly as weights in the multiplicative weight update method. Okay, so that's the first thing. So now we know how to increase resistances, and the other thing is that you know well. Are, we just you know that we now just need to repeat it at most uh, uh, row at epsilon squared times, and the way we take, get the answer is actually taking the average of all the Dirac flows that we have seen. Okay, and clearly by what I just said, we know that you know, this algorithm works and it gives us one minus epsilon approximation to max flow in time, which is uh, well roughly rho times n over epsilon squared. So this is the number of iterations, and you know uh, uh, till the n time is just the time needed. For, uh, for computing each of these logical flows. So, so we just get an algorithm <coughs> that is an approximation to max flow. Of course, you know, when you look at this learning time, there is one big question here. It's like the question is, you know, how big this row can be? Okay? Because for now, we just say it in terms of row, but a priori, we don't know what it can be. So now, to really finish the analysis of this algorithm, we need to get some you know, good bound on row to, to, be really, to be able to set it purely in terms of epsilon. Okay? So that's how we go. So the question is, the question that it boils down to is just the following. So, you know, uh, well, we have our electric flow by f star represented to our current thesis. And the question is, you know, if I look worst case over all possible graphs, you know, and all possible resistances, you know, how big can this, uh, can this uh, overflow? I mean, how, how, how big of a flow on a particular edge can be here? And you know, if you think about this question, then the well, answer would be not too good, because in, in general, rho can be very large. Okay, it can be as large as you know the essentially f star, because you know if the resistances are arbitrary, what you can do is that you can just you know you just put some very small resistance of one on one on one edge that collects S and T, and then of course the if it will be very small compared to the other resistances, then of course the flow will be the magnetic flow will be incentivized to put all the flow on this one edge, and you will get a very a very bad uh, overflow. Okay, you will get the overflow of f star, which would Lead to algorithm that is actually even not polynomial because it depends on the value of the flow. Well, the flow for unit capacity is at most n, so it will be polynomial, so it will be n squared, but definitely nothing that we will be happy about. Okay? So that's the problem. But fortunately, there is an easy fix. So what you just do is that you know, whenever you actually want to compute your electric flow, you don't do it by just you know, taking the resistances and plugging it into your electric flow solver. What you actually do, you regularize this uh, this uh, resistances before before passing them on. So essentially, you just take the original resistance, but then you add a, you mix in a uniform distribution into it. Okay, so just you 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 mix in a little bit of uh, of a uniform distribution to it, and this way you just make sure that no resistance is too small compared to the average resistance of the of the of the, uh, in the graph. Okay. And now, once you do the regularization, then you can actually show that uh, you know that uh, that that you can, can you can have some bound in the resistance, and you can show that it's never bigger than square root of n over epsilon. Okay. And initially, I was planning to actually show this. It's not a hard proof, and in a sense, it explains what's going on and one, once you, what, why you want to actually use the flows flows. What is magical about them? But I guess I will skip it because I am a bit uh, running behind time. 
So you know you, you can just trust me on that, and in the next lecture there will be again a similar proof happening. So then you can just uh, again understand why you know why. Okay, the, the very short reason is that the square root of n is coming from the fact that you know uh, elliptical flows are minimizing. So if all sensors are one, then elliptical flows are minimizing the sum of squares of the flows. Okay, and you can prove that the sum of squares of the flows, which is the energy, can never be bigger than uh, than n or m actually, or m is close to n, and then you just know that each of these terms is at most, uh, well, it's at most n, so the, taking square root of both sides gives you what you, uh, what gives you uh, the square root of n. So, so roughly this is the key reason why you want to uh, look at the typical flows, that's why you, know, you turn L2 minimization into, into the square root, square root of n variety, but again, in the lecture three, I will again like, go over a proof where you, know, where you can see it fleshed out, but essentially the idea is, uh, is still the same, okay? Is that fine with this rushed explanation? Okay. So okay. So once you know that, then uh, essentially now once you have a bound on row, you know that you what you get here is that there's n to the three halves algorithm. Okay, and this is less than ideal because you know we did all this work to exactly beat this n to the three halves bound. Okay, so we, we wanted to do better. Okay, so how can you actually uh, well actually beat this n to the three halves barrier here? Well, sort of the idea here is just the following. So okay, first of all. You know, uh, what we know is that the running time is clearly dominated by the number of the number of rows that tells us how many electrical flow computations we have to do. Okay? And you know, we just well I just claim that we can prove that this is roughly at most square root of n. Okay? So the obvious question is, you know, can we improve this bound? Yes, if we improve this bound, we are done. We, we are just you know, we are just getting into the bound and everything works. Unfortunately, we can't really improve this bound, and here is the reason why. So imagine that your graph just looks like that. So it has roughly, there's S and T, and there is roughly square root of n paths of square root of n length. Okay? And then there is just one edge, a shortcutting edge, that connects S and T directly. Okay? So what can we say about this graph? So clearly, the value of max flow in this graph is roughly square root of n, because you know, each path takes, uh, like is able to support a unit flow from S to T. But then if you look at the linear flow, then what will happen is that the effective distance of this one edge Will be comparable to the effective distance of this whole system of paths. Okay, just in a, just each each path has a distance of square root of n, and there is square root of n uh, part of the path. So uh, the effective distance of this part is one, and of course this edge also has a, uh, has a distance of, uh, effective distance of one. So essentially, uh, what will happen is that the flow will roughly send half of the flow on on this path and half of the flow on this edge. So this will really give us a square root of n, uh, a square root of n over n. But notice that here. The resistances are all one, so we don't even have to do regularization and it's sealed. Uh, this is this is the, the bad case here. Okay, so that's a real problem. So we can't really improve this bound on the row. So what do we do now? Uh, it looks like a dead end. Well, uh, what we do actually is just we look at this example, this bad example again. Okay, and we make the following observation. So how about just removing this shortcutting edge from the from the okay, So what will happen? Well. The max flow will not change much, right? We remove one edge, but the value of max flow is square root of n. So we just removed one, one over square root of n fraction of the max flow. And we are okay with a minus, one minus epsilon, uh, uh, epsilon uh, approximation, where epsilon usually is taken to be some constant. Okay, so clearly we can afford to remo uh, remove this edge. It will not change our answer too much. But on the other hand, the funny thing is that once we remove this edge, then the behavior of the electrical flow in the residual graph becomes much, much, much nicer. Actually, electrical flow becomes a max flow right away. Okay? So this is the observation, and you know, it, it works for this uh, particular case, but can we turn it into a general, like, a reliable algorithm here? And of course, I wouldn't be asking this question if, if it, it wasn't the case that you can do that. And roughly, the idea is just the following. So what we do, we just make our oracle self-enforce some smaller width row prime. Okay? So we just have some our ideal row prime that we would like to enforce. And what we just do is just we just, we just modify our oracle, this computation of the flow in the following way. So you know, whenever we compute the electrical flow, we look at this flow, and if we see that some edge is flowing more than row prime, what we do is just remove this edge forever from our graph and recompute the flow. Okay? And we keep doing this until we get a satisfying flow or until we disconnect S and T and then there is a catastrophe. And like we just keep doing this, and only when we see a flow that actually satisfies this constraint of row prime that, that doesn't have any flow bigger than row prime, we actually pass it on to our multiplicatory update procedure. So simply only then we use it to update our resistances and, and include it in our final solution. Okay? 
So, so, so is it clear what, what's happening here? So are there any questions about that? So essentially, like, we are just trying a very dumb, very, uh, uh, very simplistic way of, en of enforcing a uh, good, uh, good overflow is just whenever we see an overflow we don't like, we just remove this edge forever and recompute the flow. And we are hoping that at some point we get the right flow. Okay? Oh, sorry. I just be done. So clearly, you know, what you can observe is that if this strategy always ends up working, so we always, you know, after not too many iterations, we get a solution that we like, then clearly, you know, the whole multiplicative weight update framework will allow us to conclude that, you know, we have an oracle of, with rho prime, so we will get a running time that's proportional to rho prime as opposed to rho. Okay? But of course, you know, this is, this is a bit tricky because, you know, the question is what is the right setting of rho prime to make all it work? Because, you know, on one hand, of course, we want rho prime to be as small as possible because this will uh, govern the number of iterations of multiplicative weights that we have. But on the other hand, you know, if we put rho prime too small, let's say if you pr put rho prime to be one, then all you will ever do is just will keep removing edges from your graph. And you will never, uh, you will disconnect SMT and at some point you will realize that, okay, you, you can't compute anything. Okay, so you can't be too aggressive in your choice of raw graph. And, you know, it turns out that the sweet spot to actually set raw prime to sort of to balance out these two effects is n to the one terms. And again, I am, uh, actually I have 15 minutes. Okay, so it's a yeah. fun. Sorry. Sorry. Do you have time for more questions? I have time for more questions too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so, but let, uh, let me just finish. So, so essentially, the key reason that allows you to to do the, uh, well to, to do this is just you the effect that you have is already the effect that I had in this example. So, what you can prove is that whenever you remove edges that flow a lot in your in your uh, electrical flow, then uh, well, on one hand. They don't change max flow much, but they, they don't perturb max flow much. But what they do, they increase the energy of the flow by a lot. Okay, so, so that's the way. Like so, that's the way you make progress. So roughly speaking, what you do really is that you introduce a potential function, which is just the energy of the electrical flow with respect to your current resistance. And you know, whenever you remove an edge, you assume that the resistance becomes infinity. Okay, and this will well, and this will be your potential function. And then what you show is or you, what you can show that initially, this energy will not be too small. Okay, and uh, also it can't be too large. So essentially, unless there is some safety condition, so unless you don't remove too many edges from your graph, then there is some upper bound of the energy that you can ever uh, that you can ever attain. So you know you have a potential that has good lower bound and upper bound. And now also, what you know is that you know the way the multiplicative weight update method manipulates these resistances makes them always grow. Okay, so essentially we are always increasing our resistances. We never decrease them. So because of that, we know that this potential factor, this energy, is never decreasing either. Okay, so it's always can only, can only grow. So essentially, we have these two quantity, these two points that make our uh, energy be a good potential function. So it, it always moves on one direction. It doesn't start to be too small, and it can't get too large. So the only missing piece that uh, one needs to show, and well, I will not show it, but you can show it, is that removal of any overflowing edge uh, ends up, you know, increasing the energy significantly. Okay, and essentially, once you uh, put all the math on it, once you just do the, all the calculation, you realize that the setting of row prime to be roughly n to the one third is the right setting. Okay, and this is the way you get this faster. So the root time you get up is this example of root time uh, is there something similar that explains the one, set, the one third? There is an example that gives you the n to the one, uh, ten to the four thirds behavior. Yes. So it looks lo something like. I have to draw from memory, but roughly speaking, you have a path of, so this is S. So you, you, you have S here, okay? Let's try it. It's, it's not the best algorithm, I guess. I should just have taken a, a bunch of these. So uh, we have a path of, it's roughly of length, length n to the one third. And then essentially this is a path of, like it's, it has parallel edges. So there is, there is yeah. n, to the, n to the one third uh, like edges in parallel. And now what you do, you have to put some shortcutting edges. So essentially what you do is just, you put shortcutting edges as, as, as such, okay? And then what will be happening is that when you compute the electrical flow here, sorry, 
That's two that's, that's n to the one third. Uh, like so, the max flow value here is n to the one third, right? Because this path is able to support. So no, no, but you, you want uh, n Oh sure. Uh, just add. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can always make like just add. Uh, just make this path also uh, long here. Just okay. to get enough. Uh, well, uh, just to get enough vertices here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what will happen is that when you compute the vertical flow, then at first this edge will be the shortcut in hand, the one. It actually will get a flow of n to the one third, well, more than n to the one third once you set the time to rise. So then you remove it. But then this edge will get n to the one third, and you will keep removing this n to the one third edges until you, at the end, you will get a nice path and you will quickly converge. But sort of you, you really will get this, this worst thing behavior here, yes? So two questions. First of all, that epsilon, f, that's not the same. Is it the same epsilon as the approximation? Yes. Well, you mean um, you mean this epsilon, right? No, I mean and, and this as well. Yeah, yeah, it's the same epsilon. It's epsilon and same epsilon. Yeah. Uh, but my main question is: uh, <coughs> so what falls apart if the graph is directed? Uh, well, one big thing that falls apart is that you can't compute logical flow. Like the problem is that computer I flow, see. Electric flow is an undirected notion, so yeah. you cannot make it. If you were able to compute, so if you were like able to simulate diodes efficiently, uh -huh. so you only always enforce that. It just go the right direction, and you would sort my diagonal mass flow, and actually could solve it even exactly then because of the self-reducibility of mass of diagonal mass flow. So, mm -hmm. but <coughs> you can't do that. And actually, like so the whole linear algebra, like the fast approaches, they, they crucially rely on the fact that it's undirected motion. Yeah. 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 Oracle itself be seen as solving another optimization problem where now the capacity constraints are uh, row prime instead of row, and it's solving that by a multiplicative update method where well, the penalty is very severe. Uh, no, uh, not really, because then the convergence would be much. Okay. Actually, yes, but like, but the point is that when you do that, you will get the same algorithm. Like the updates will be the same because in the updates you are really normalizing by the, the worst case overflow, right? So, uh, so essentially, like, yes, that's true, but it's not a different algorithm. It's, it's exactly the same algorithm. It just like it doesn't really like so the whole like like you see what I'm saying. Like, no, actually, it will be even worse because it, the convergence will be very small because once you have non non uh, non uh, unit capacities, then you also normalize your updates by that, and then. Everything like would have very small, like very tiny updates, and the convergence would be much worse. So actually, no. So the updates will be almost the same, except they will be scaled also. So when you have these updates, there are like one plus epsilon. Now it's just F e over rho i. So now, essentially, if you wanted to add capacities, then you would also add the capacity here. Okay, and now you would sort of slow down. So like the same answers. Okay, so. You should always say that the same answers, like, so the resistances will just, adding capacity corresponds to scaling all the resistances by just UE, so we will only change the answers, but the answers for, like, most of the, oh, no, sorry, it will work, uh, so, of course, uh, this will just, uh, this will just absorb the, uh, the scale, so, sorry, so, my, uh, my initial answer is, is correct, so, it will, you will just get the same algorithm, yes, like, like, you will just get the same algorithm, because, it, it, like, the answers will be the same. No, so, the Oracle is now solving a slightly different problem, where, uh, it is uh, it is has the average flow constraint, and then the capacity constraint on each edge is now row prime instead of one. Yeah, well, okay. So the point is that the whole thing would work essentially the same if all you just did is whenever you have an edge that has capacity uh, uh, well uh, bigger than row prime, you just multiply the resistance by two, which essentially could be like essentially what I could have done. I could not I could not like I could avoid this removal step and just let it. Actually, pass it to the uh, well. Pass it to the to the to the to the to the multiplication weights. They would do the right thing because they would multiply this edge by some co by some constant fraction, and you know the analysis would work the same. Except in the analysis, I would have to again decompose it mentally into this and the other steps. But yes, if I didn't do if I didn't implement the uh, the removal of the edges myself, I would just let the effective distance do it. It would work. It just that like, this is the clinical analysis to just have to separate these two things. Is there anything that can be said about uh, about the value of rho throughout the algorithm evolution of the width? Can it get worse if you start from a better 
Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question, and I don't know any answers to it. Like, I think you would expect your read to be bad throughout the whole iteration. It's because roughly what it corresponds to is that you are setting some weighting on your edges, and you ask for minimizing this average. Okay, so no, whatever, whatever edges will get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, weight, they will behave well because you will force them to behave well. But the edges that, but then it always leaves some edges to have a bit less than average uh, than average weight. And so, so the result of this would be that these edges would be more likely to get big width. Like so, I think okay, I didn't observe experiments, but the way I view this whole method, I think it always there's always one edge which leads you trouble. But can it get worse? That's the point. So if you start from a point that's yes, I think it can get worse. It can get worse. It can I think go, I, I think it can worse. I haven't answered it, but okay. okay, there is nothing I can see that would prevent it that to, from getting worse. It's like because it doesn't seem to be uh, connected to you know how good your current solution is. To the, to the max flow because it sort of it always just tries to find the bottlenecks yes? and then to weight the bottlenecks well but then leaves everything else relatively uh, like, like once you are doing uh, well on some edges they get very, uh, they get smaller weight uh, in the in this so they are no more likely to actually become bad okay so we are just playing this you know whack a mole game always yes? so there's always you know if you squish it here then it will pop out somewhere else and the point is that we want to make sure that this that this mold is not popping out in one place too often that's all that you're playing but it doesn't say anything about how bad it is in each of the iterations. Can I ask one more question about this? What would happen if you replace all the thirds here by halves? Uh, sorry, all the? All the thirds in this picture by halves. If you, all the thirds of then? You erase the, the, yeah. the left. <coughs> yeah, I know. And, and yes. So now we probably would get another example of, uh, of, of square root of n, right? <coughs> no, no, you couldn't, right? So what why you would you have many you have many bad edges simultaneously and you fix them so because your threshold is one third. Oh yeah, of course. Why would you fail the algorithm? No, no, like let me think. That's actually that's a great question actually. What would happen is exactly like so. The point is that I sort of we chose the uh, uh, we chose the uh, we chose the sort of the threshold score in such a way that you know always the. The uppermost edge is just above our threshold, but all the others are on the low. Okay. So I think in square root of n, I would look like my computation in front of whiteboard are very bad, but I think what would happen is that all of them will be bad, and we will just remove all of them in one step. No, that no, but like if if an edge. It's hard to see why the third and one half is no, no, okay. substantially different. No, so it cannot happen because like if you have <coughs> square root of uh, okay, no, they all would have n to the one third, right? So yeah, so roughly, but I think so essentially then. Take it off. Yeah, yeah, let's take it offline because it's actually interesting because I, I'm not sure that okay, I would have to think about it. Because, let's take it offline. Yeah, well, let's take it offline. Like for well, okay, let's make, let's take it off. But that's a, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it. Well, it should work, right? Yeah, we have a proof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a, a one here. Uh, let me just think about it. Okay. So uh, yeah, so this is the algorithm, and that's essentially okay. <laughs> one question. <laughs> so I'm just trying to understand your. Argument is of the flavor that the, the edges or, or uh, the, ed the portions of the problem that contribute badly to the width are also the portions of the problem that contribute negligibly to the objective value. Yes. Okay. So uh, can can that argument be made more abstract and more general and applied to the general multiplicity of updates? For yes. So if so, is that a known uh, generalization? Well, it's sort of, it's false. Like, so essentially, what you can, like, if you look at analysis, what you can show is that, okay, so it's, okay, sorry, sorry, it, it can, it works, so there's one missing piece. Like, so yes, it's true that I rely on the fact that, you know, if something has a big over, like, okay, so it works for any oracle that ends up to minimize the quadratic function. Okay, so like, if your answer are coming from minimizing the quadratic function, then the same strategy works. Okay? Because the point that you are like you have to keep in mind here is that we're using the fact that yes, if I remove any individual uh, edge, it changes the objective not much, but then it changes the energy in a lot. And so you have to have some notion of energy that uh, well, that you have. So I think what you can do uh, this is actually something I was just playing with the other day. I think you know you can define an LP minimization 
like prominence which your argument is given by LP immunization. So for sure you can use it. Okay, not for sure. Not for sure. I have to still prove it. But you, because you know energy is just one of the like you can like the way you prove it is just by looking at the dual. So you can look at the dual of any LP immunization and see what you get here. And I think what you should be able to prove is well it is something like that. You know if you are using LP immunization oracle, then by using this technique you can get uh, only n to the one over p iteration uh, iteration uh, in bound. Okay, so for L one it just ends. There is nothing that you can really, uh, there is nothing that you can really do. But uh, <coughs> but you can speed that if you have a bigger power speed. But this is something I have not verified. This is just my, my intuition that I was just thinking about that. Because that's an interesting thing. Exactly, it's just sort of trying to understand the whole like sort of the, the picture. You know what happens <coughs> depending on the like. As I said, the result uh, this rho over square root, uh, rho over epsilon squared result it works for this like like weakest condition ever. It's like you just assume that there is some orbit which corresponds to L1 immunization, but even not that. So the question is, you know, what are the stronger conditions on your oracle that you can impose so, so to get better guarantees? Okay, and and and, uh, and this is one uh, this is one one way of trying to, to get some structure that assuming that this is that the answers are given by minimizing some LP norm over your uh, over your physical space. Okay, which will improve the weighting of your terms. Okay, and that's so I think that's so. Like I think that this generalizes more. Actually, when we uh, in the lecture in the afternoon when we talk about integer method, this this thing will come back again, and then it's much more general in sense, right? Because this actually applies to all integer like the all LPs when you solve them in integer method. But that's exactly the same thing like that. There are constraints you can identify that give you trouble with convergence, but you know, you can do something with them and not changing the problem much, but improving convergence a lot. So in this sense, yes, it can. It's much more broad. I actually this is something I'm thinking about. It's exactly. How to abstract it up to this? Like, you know, like so, somehow I see this at play in many many scenarios when you use this effect, but you know, that you change the problem a little bit and uh, and it improves convergence a lot. And again, this is nothing new. So, but the question is how to abstract it up to that. I think this is a general principle, but I just haven't found exactly way of crypto of of phrasing. Okay, so actually now I finish on time. Thanks. <laughs>